Hey, First Temple. In April of last year, you voted to give $400,000 of our land sale money to invest right back into our community through our local partners. I want to show you some of the things that our partners have done with that money. At Feed My Sheep, they've repaired some of the leakage and damages on their roof, and this will allow them to begin making renovations to the inside of their building. At the Unincluded Club's Urban Farm, they have bought a tractor and are preparing their land to not only plant crops at a larger scale, but also add a greenhouse, and they've added a prayer trail to that land. Thank you to those of you who have helped clear the trees and laid the rocks for that trail. At Family Promise, the roof has officially begun to go up for the brand new facility, the Promise House. This is going to allow them to serve twice as many families as they serve right now. At CTLC, they have improved their loading and unloading zone, and they've fixed and improved parts of the inside of their facility. This allows them to unload the food that they use to serve hundreds of families in our community every single month. At Helping Hands, in addition to helping their clients with almost $6,000 in utility assistance, they have also made updates to their computer lab, chapel, and purchased an electric pallet jack. Thank you again for your hilarious generosity. If you'd like to be a part of what's going on in the community, all of our local partners are in need of volunteers right now. Please go to firsttemple.org slash missions to see how you can get involved today. Well, good morning, First Temple. Good morning, everybody watching online as well. Thank you for joining us today. We wanted to show you that video. We showed it last week on Easter Sunday as well. We wanted to show it one more time just to celebrate some of the things that we have seen God doing with our partners. And thank you for your generosity and participation in what God is doing. I think about the Promise House there uh, with Family Promise, this incredible organization that hosts homeless families and, and in Till now, different churches, including us in the community, have hosted those families in their church building. But this facility is going to allow them to serve a lot more families. And we're still going to serve. We're just going to go to them. And that's going to be a beautiful thing. And we're celebrating with them. So it's the Sunday after Easter. <laughs> and historically, this Sunday in churches has been one of the lowest attended Sundays Ever, right? It really is. You guys are like, Why? we're here, so you get gold stars. Way to go. But there's something about it the week after where you're kind of like, okay, now what? Like we had the beautiful instruments and the flowers, and it was this beautiful big thing. What do we do now? How do we respond? What's next? Maybe when you're confronted with this kind of anxiety about what to do next, you've said these words, I'm going for a walk. I'm going to go process and think and just be somewhere else. One of my earliest childhood memories is sitting in my living room as a small kid and watching my aunt, who was, I don't know, 17 at the time, just having a fight with my grandparents about a boy or a curfew or something. It could be a lot of things. She threw on her, like, you know, cool leather jacket. She said, I'm going for a walk, you know, and she stormed out of the house. <laughs> That's what we do. We've got questions and frustrations, and we kind of don't know what do we do with ourselves right now. I don't know. I'm just going to go for a walk. Maybe we have emotional crashes or disappointment, feel stuck in our routine. I mean, last week we just celebrated that Christ is risen. It was a big day, and maybe the rest of the week has not felt so great. What do we do? Today I hope that we discover Jesus is the answer for our eternal longings, is the answer that Scripture that we have been given points to. And the only way that we can respond to this Jesus, the one who opened his eyes to us, is to open our eyes to him, to see that he is with us and around us, to point to him the very way that we live. We're going to meet two characters today in the book of Luke, and they're dealing with some of this post-Easter, what do we do? There you have heard maybe that Jesus, something is happening at the tomb, but they still don't really know. But certainly they've seen their Lord be killed. And so we meet Cleopas and this unnamed companion. Perhaps it's its wife. Per, perhaps, it's his, uh, perhaps it's Luke himself who wrote the book. We, we don't know. But we find these two walking. 
Three days after Jesus has been killed on Easter Sunday, frustrated, tired, processing. Maybe they're trying to just get somewhere else, trying to get somewhere that doesn't remind them of what they've been through. And that's where we pick up the story in Luke 24. This is Luke 24, starting in verse 13. Now on that same day, that is Easter Sunday, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they're talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? And Jesus asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests, our leaders, handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped. Notice the past tense there. We had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back, and they told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, they, but they did not see him. So here you meet these two characters, followers of Jesus, clearly, but they're not the named disciples, right? They're not the A-list disciples that we all know. These are some side characters. So interesting, Jesus first appears to women, and now he's appearing to these kind of C-list people. Because <laughs> that's what he does. What he's done is for all people. He sees these people, walks up next to them. They don't see him, at least not who he really is. They're grieving. Sad. Haven't you heard? All they can think about is their grief because it says we had hoped. And we left everything to follow this guy. We thought he would be the one that would redeem Israel, would kick Rome out, would make us a power again. We would be in charge and, well, he was killed. The text says their eyes were made closed. I think they're closed because their hope is closed. They're trapped in their own disbelief. How could this person be Jesus? I mean, people don't come back to life. And Jesus plays along. That's what they're talking about. Perhaps you've been in a situation where there's something on your mind and it encompasses everything. Maybe it's a good thing. It's all you can think about. Maybe it's a bad thing. It's all you can think about. You're distracted, lost in a cloud. I think that's how these two are as they walk. They've seen this terrible thing happen with their Lord. They're hearing these strange stories on Sunday morning, and they just go. <laughs> we need to go for a walk. <laughs> C.S. Lewis, the great writer and thinker, he wrote extensively after his wife died. And he wrote about how shortly after she died, he tried to avoid anything or any place that might remind him of her. So he would never go somewhere where they had been together. He found a new grocery store, a new everything, to try to avoid the grief. And you know what? It didn't work. He said, I found out that grief is like the sky above. It's over everything. I think that's what's going on with these two. I think maybe if we just get out of town, maybe if we kind of run away, we won't have to deal with the challenges, the fear, the disappointment and the challenge. Maybe over there, it will be different. How often we do the same things. 
or things are hard or scary or challenging or difficult, let's just go somewhere else. These two are looking for answers in all the wrong places. And because their eyes are focused out there, they miss what is right in front of them. See, all of us have an Emmaus where we look to for answers that is the wrong place. One writer says it like this. Maybe it's the mall where the noise of shopping and the rush of people keep you from thinking about life. Maybe it's the bar where booze and beer nuts help numb you to the more bitter truths that swirl outside the windows of that dark and smoky room. Maybe it's the matinee of the movies where you take in what Hollywood proudly touts as escapist fare. Maybe it's that TV remote control that takes you away from all of it as you mindlessly channel surf every single evening. I would add maybe it's the little screens that you carry in your pocket that you can escape to at any point. We try to escape our troubles. That's when we head to Emmaus. Think maybe we can escape the grief, the challenge. They do this, but as Christians, we are called, instead of looking out everywhere else, we are to look for the one who is always with us. And that's what we see here, that Jesus is the answer. Look at how Jesus responds to these two walking. This is Luke 24, verse 25. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who would rescue you should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. People are walking and they feel like they have no hope. And Jesus said, um, I think you missed it. (laughs) Don't you see that from Moses at the beginning to the prophets at the end of the Old Testament, all of this is pointing to what you just saw. That the Redeemer would suffer and would die but then enter into his glory. He gives them a new way to look at their lives and a new way to look at at Scripture, as they have questions. And how could God redeem us? Wasn't Jesus supposed to do this or that? They have all these assumptions about God, and he says, look to the Scripture, and look at what I did. He showed him all of the ways the Scripture is telling us, pointing us to the Jesus who would suffer and die on our behalf, and who would conquer the grave. They have questions. But Jesus is the answer to the questions of our minds. He gives us the resources as revealing himself and giving us the scriptures to engage with. He shows up next to them. And I tell you, though you are not walking to an actual Emmaus today, he is showing up next to you. And he is still speaking and revealing. He is still giving us the scriptures that he speaks through his presence and power by the Holy Spirit. He is among us. He shows up and walks alongside them, brings them understanding. It's our invitation, too. We're overwhelmed with questions to take them to the Lord. Engage in the Scripture alone, but yes, with others in a community of believers. It's why we have life groups. Connect with one. Are you in one? Jesus is the answer to the questions of our mind, and he continues to be the answer. Look at verse 28. So as they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now over. So he went in to stay with them. There's a whole sermon in there about us calling out to Jesus to stay with us and him saying, yes, that's for another time. Verse 30. He was at the table with them. He took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Sound familiar? Same language that we find in the Last Supper communion. Verse 31, and their eyes were open. And they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. What a great story. Verse 32, they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? So that same hour, 
That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And the disciples were saying, the Lord has risen indeed. He appeared to Simon and then they told them what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. There are two more ways, I think, right here in the text where we see how Jesus is, is the answer And the first one I want to point out is that he is, yes, the answer to the questions of our mind, and he's also the answer to the needs of our heart. These poor two wander off to Emmaus. I don't know what to do with my life, so I guess we'll just go over there. And Jesus teaches, reveals himself, and they say, we're not our hearts burning while he was taking us through the scripture, while he was teaching us, man, we haven't felt this way since, well, I guess the last time Jesus taught to us. (laughs) As they head to Emmaus, we don't know why. But what we do know is that once Jesus has revealed that he is alive and he is with them, that all of the scriptures point to what he has done and what he will do, how he forgives and conquers death, what we know is that they no longer care about Emmaus. Verse 33 says, that same hour, (laughs) broke bread, they saw, their eyes were opened, it's Jesus. That same hour, they said, we're going going back to Jerusalem. (laughs) The text tells us that when they invited Jesus to stay, it was almost evening. Now they've eaten, it's dark outside. They don't care. (laughs) Because now they have purpose. The longings of who they are and who they're supposed to be. I mean, it is obvious. We have got to go and tell our friends. We have got to make this known that Jesus is alive. Who cares about a man? Jesus is the answer to the needs of our hearts, too. And we can look to places like Emmaus to distract us, to medicate us, to keep us fine. Or we can respond to the risen Lord who has given us purpose promise and power that when we meet him in scripture and by the power of the spirit when we respond to him all we can do is go tell reorient our lives to what he has done because nothing else nothing else is worth it jesus is the answer to the needs of our heart and he is the answer he is the answer to the pain of shame and our burden of sin See, in this text, there's all kinds of references to different places in Scripture, but to prevent this from being like a three-hour sermon, I'm going to point to one. We saw how he, he breaks bread, right? It looks like communion, the Last Supper. And then, right after that, it says their eyes were opened. It's a really interesting phrase, their eyes were opened in that moment. And I think that that this specific language is supposed to remind us of another place in Scripture, and it's at the very beginning. It's in Genesis. A couple weeks ago in our Vices and Virtues series, we were talking about about lust and sexual integrity, and you're like, oh, you're going to talk about this again? Just for a second. It's okay. (laughs) And God creates humanity. And in Genesis 2, 25, it says, that the man and his wife were both naked, but they were not ashamed. This is this vision we are given of this beautiful intimacy, naked and unashamed. That language there is not just about clothes. It means that we might be exposed, vulnerable, and unafraid, that we might be our full selves, not hiding anything truly known and seen, unashamed. Can you imagine being unashamed? I believe that this verse points to us the way that we are meant to be to God. Naked and unashamed, exposed but secure. Yes, this is not just literal nudity, except when it is with a spouse or caring for a baby or caring for an elderly parent, when, when the needs of love <laughs> overcome shame. 
This is about intimacy. That the two together could be naked and unashamed with each other and with God. But you know how the story goes. They disobey God. (laughs) And shame enters the story. This is uh, Genesis 3, 6, and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree that they had been forbidden from eating was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And look at verse 7. And the eyes of both were opened. Same phrase. Their eyes were opened. And there they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They went from being naked and unashamed to covered up and full of shame. See, they had broken their relationship with God, their connection to God. They hid from God, the story will tell us. And since that time, there was a barrier between God and his people. Sin and shame. Look at what Jesus shows us. I'll read it again, verse 24, 30, and 31. They were at the table with them. He took bread, blessed it, and broke it. Remember, to be a symbol of God's body broken, his blood poured out to show us his sacrifice for us. He gave it to them, and their eyes were open. They recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. It's the same language as we found in Genesis. It is an act of undoing, of restoration. That by Christ's sacrifice, with his presence, we are seen and we don't have to hide anymore. That shame and death and sin can be defeated. That nothing will separate us from the love of God. The two on the path had hoped that Jesus might redeem Israel, and he was killed. And then he came back to life, and their hope was too small. He didn't come just to redeem Israel. He came to redeem the whole world, to undo the thing that had separated us from God, sin, the shame that we carry, to say, you are mine. I have paid the price. I see you. Jesus is the answer to the pain of shame and the burden of sin. And they experience his presence in scripture, in teaching, in worshiping together with the bread and the cup. Their eyes are open to the good news that is the news before him. The good news that broke through all the bad news. The good news that got them to turn around and walk back in the middle of the night. One writer says it like this. I believe that although the two disciples did not recognize Jesus on that road, Jesus recognized them. He saw them as if they were the only two people in the world. And I believe that the reason why this story is still the most extraordinary thing and continues to be is because he sees us too. Just like that. That not even in the darkness of death are we lost to him or lost to each other. I believe, whether we recognize him or not, believe in him or not, even know his name, that he is walking there right beside us, inviting us to respond, showing us through scripture, through worship, a new hope, a new vision of a light that not even the dark can overcome. This little passage, I think, is this great summary of the Christian faith. Our human hopes fail. We turn to try to find help somewhere, anywhere, and then we realize that all of Scripture that we have been given is pointing to the Jesus who already helps, who is already with us, who is present, who sees us and wants to be seen, too, through His Scripture the power of his Holy Spirit as we gather together as a church, as we worship. I realize that in this story, this terrible grief that they're carrying of watching their Lord be killed, in just three days they discover that he's alive. And the challenges and the pains that we may be facing right now don't 
always get redeemed that quickly. They may not even get redeemed in our lifetimes to see, but the story of the resurrection is that things get redeemed. They can be made whole. The day will come when death is no more. When we will break bread like they broke bread with Jesus. Fully ourselves. Fully present, fully seen, fully known. Paul says it like this to the church in Philippi, I am confident in this. The one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, in his grief, tried to run, hide from his challenges, his frustration. And he found that that didn't help, that the grief was like the sky. Another writer responded to Lewis and said, yes, grief is like the sky, but this story shows us that while grief may feel like it's over everything now, so apparently is hope over everything, no matter where you are or what you're dealing with. (laughs) Open your eyes, because God is at work. God is right next to you, even now have you opened your eyes. Have you looked to him in his word, in community, in worship, in prayer? Have you turned to him? Give up Emmaus. Embrace the Emmanuel, God with us. I pray this morning you know That the Father who showed up to these two shows up to you. That continues to see you like he saw them. And I pray that we together might discover afresh the power of his love. For the questions of our mind. For the longings of our heart. A love and a redemption that conquers shame and sin and even death. May we discover it together in scripture, in teaching, in worship, in presence with one another. Christ is alive and he is with us. As we end this morning, I I want us to do an exercise together. We're going to say a prayer together aloud. And you're like, we're Baptist. What are you doing making us pray aloud together? I know, but it's fun. Just trust me. We're going to say this prayer together, and it's a prayer that Christians have said for hundreds of years. It comes from a prayer called St. Patrick's Breastplate, like St. Patrick's Day, St. Patrick. Yeah, that's where it's from. We're close enough to the holiday. We can use it. But I love this prayer because I want it to be our prayer together, that as we go and as we go from here, that we might realize how close Christ is to us, that we might open our eyes to see him. I think this prayer invites us to do just that. And at the end of it, it also invites us to reflect a little bit on what others see when they look at us. Let's say this prayer together, and may it be our prayer as a church. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Lord, may it come to pass. Do it among us. Amen.